Hi everybody, welcome to this episode of Enlightenment Today. I'm Jason. Today we're going to speak about the four nutriments of Buddhism. Now the four nutriments of Buddhism are four kinds of food people consume daily. We all consume these foods. But don't just think edible foods, even though that is one of them. The four kinds of food are edible food, sense impressions, volition, and consciousness, both individual and collective. Now, when we look at edible food, obviously, that food is what goes in through the mouth. When we look at sense impressions, the sensory experience we have, these are what we take in through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. So basically what we hear, what we read, what we touch, when you're playing with your smartphone, uh, the sound of traffic outside, and the advertisement you read, these are all going in through your, sense, through your senses. And this is basically a food that we take in as part of the four nutriments. When we look at volition, volition is basically your will, your concerns, your desires. So volition is a food because it feeds your decisions, your actions, and your movements. But keep in mind that Buddhism is not saying that your volition is essentially bad because without volition you wouldn't move and when you don't move you, you wither away and probably die. Now the fourth nutriment, the fourth food, includes your individual consciousness and the way your mind feeds itself and feeds your thoughts and your actions. You know we all have a mind and we know that our mind is constantly feeding on itself. When we look at the collective consciousness aspect of this nutriment, this is how we are affected by group think. So think of a small group that you might be effect, affected by, a society, a larger group or a religion, or even the media. You know, the media often influence the way we think. They often poison us with our attitudes towards the world. They poison us with hatred, anger, cynicism, so forth and so on. So we need to be mindful that the four nutriments can be healthy or unhealthy nourishing or toxic. It really depends on what we consume and how aware we are of our consumption, how conscious we are of our consumption of what we're taking in through these four nutriments. Because we often consume things unconsciously. We often consume food unconsciously. We watch TV unconsciously. Um, and usually this is always related to our emotions. You know, Usually when we are upset, for example, a lot of people might turn to um, a lot of food to suppress this particular emotion that they have. And when we look at obesity and psychological problems, this seems to be the prevailing tendency behind them, that we are not dealing with our emotions. Instead, we are trying to suppress them with external stimuli. So when we look at edible food, for example, edible food um, we usually distract, ourself, distract ourselves from the emotions that we have within us or the situations that we need to deal with with junk food or, or alcohol. We have all had an experience where we've had a tough situation with somebody or circumstances happen in our life or there are particular emotions that we have to deal with where we often turn to alcohol to try and make us happy when usually that only suppresses the problem and make it worse. Now this also relates into the sensory level. So when we look at the sense impressions aspect of the four nutrients, we usually try to suppress certain emotions or problems that we have with video games or we go to watch a movie or we read a magazine or we engage in frivolous gossip with our friends or we are constantly engaged with the, with a smartphone. And I don't understand this attraction to smartphones that people have, but there is this constant engagement. Um, it doesn't have to be unhealthy or like this with edible foods or sense impressions, but we usually don't choose healthy food or we don't choose healthy sense impressions to take in. We usually turn towards these more unhealthy aspects because they are emotionally driven. When we look at our volition, for example, our volition can be very healthy. It can contribute to constructive motivation. You can be motivated constructively. But our volition can be also be unhealthy. 
Um, it can be determined by craving and obsession. A lot of people become super obsessed about something and according to Buddhism, this is an un unhealthy volition. This is an unhealthy aspect of the four nutriments. When we look at the collective consciousness aspect of consciousness, we are often affected by the group. We're affected by society or by religion. And we begin to think that way. Our individual consciousness begins to mimic collective consciousness. When usually, when we look at the way society is built, society should be the makeup of individuals, not the collective consciousness imposing its will upon the individual. So you need to become sovereign of your own consciousness. This aspect of the nutriment is very important. You need to become sovereign of this individual consciousness aspect. Okay, so we need to guard the nine gates. This is what the East would say, and also in Egyptian philosophy. On the individual consciousness level, we need to guard these nine gates. And these nine gates are the two eyes, the two ears, the two nostrils, the mouth, the anus, and the penis or vagina, depending on which gender you are. Now, why this is important is this begins to make conscious the four nutriments. You begin to become aware of what you are taking in as a food that contributes to your being. So this also relates to the sixth sense philosophy in Egypt. So the nine gates, for example, what we take in through these nine gates, that we have these nine openings within our body, contributes to the way our mind is. Now to explain that, the sixth, the sixth sense philosophy is related to the eye of Horus symbol, personified in the Egyptian goddess Wajet. Superficially, the eye of Horus is thought of as a symbol referring to protection, royal power, and good health. But esoterically, it conceals the ancient philosophy of the six senses. Now, we know what the five senses are. What is the sixth sense that is driven by these five senses? And why is it important to guard the nine gates? Now, why it's important to guard the nine gates is because what you take in through your senses, through your mouth, and everywhere, even um, your sexual stimulation drives your sixth sense. Now your sixth sense is your thoughts and or your mind. Usually it's translated as thoughts. So the more pure the food you take in through the nine gates, the more pure your mind is. The more subtle your thoughts are, they're not jumping around here and there. They become very subtle, more still, but you need to become conscious of what you are consuming through the nine gates. What food you are taking in, what four nutriments you are taking in. So if we don't become conscious of the four nutriments, we affect the individual consciousness too much on a subconscious level, on the samskara level, to use Sanskrit terminology. We affect too much on that subconscious level. Often we are mind, mindless with what we are taking in. It's emotionally driven, we take in food, it's emotionally driven. We mindlessly watch TV because we had a bad day at work. And all of this attitude is because we are not making conscious what we are consuming, the four nutriments that we are consuming through this psychosomatic organism. Now, when we are not conscious, as I said, this contributes to the samskara level, the, the subconscious, the deep subconscious level, which usually unconsciously drives our thoughts, our habits, and our actions. So Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh explains this beautifully with the analogy of radio NST. Radio NST is radio non-stop thinking. So Radio non-stop thinking means that we constantly have this radio, internal radio station going on in our mind, which is continually jumping here and there, our thoughts are bouncing around here and there. And this results from the deep samskaras at the subconscious level that are just bubbling up unconsciously, these thoughts that are just bouncing around in our skull that we identify with. So radio NST, is better explained this way. So basically, when we shut off external stimuli from our mind, it is still moving. Our mind is still constantly moving, even though we may be sitting still. So we could use a ceiling fan as an analogy. 
When a ceiling fan power is turned on, it's going, and then when you turn the power off, it has a little bit of juice in it and it continues to move a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. So you might recognize this when you are, you sit to go in meditation, in stillness meditation or <clears throat> awareness of breath meditation, you'll, you'll be conscious that your mind is continually moving even though you are sitting completely still. You've shut off all external stimuli, but the radio channel, the internal station of radio NST, is continually moving. So we're constantly consuming our thoughts in this way. We're constantly ruminating on our thoughts on the individual consciousness part of the nutrients. So in this manner, we are like cows, goats, and buffalo because cows, goats, and buffalo, they chew their food, they swallow it, and then they regurgitate and chew it multiple times. Now I know that you and I are not cow, goat, not a cow, goat, or buffalo, but we ruminate just the same on our thoughts, and usually they are negative thoughts. There is no reason why we should be ruminating primarily on negative thoughts, but this is related to the negativity bias within our brain. And if you want to know more about that, I suggest looking at Rick Hansen's work. But when you look into your mind, usually through the day, you have many positive experiences, and then what, there might be one minute negative experience that you continually focus on. And this, <clears throat> this constant rumination on your thoughts and negative thinking is very similar to the way cow, cows, goats, and buffalo chew their food and regurgitate it multiple times. So from this perspective, especially from the East, and also what Thich Nhat Hanh would explain is, or what he would um, advocate is, how do we turn off radio NST? How do we turn this internal radio station off or turn the volume down? So we need a, effective strategies, basically. Thich Nhat Hanh's strategy would be mindful awareness. He thinks of mindful awareness as the perfect strategy to guard the nine gates and to be more conscious of the four nutriments we take in. He believes that mindful awareness is like sunscreen protection to a baby with sensitive skin. So when we have mindful awareness, when we practice mindfulness, we are more aware of what we are taking in through our eyes and our ears, what we're putting in our mouth. And he is completely right about that. Another method, another effective strategy would be the ancient lifestyle philosophy and practice of fasting the mind. Now I explain this more in detail in my book of the same name, Fasting the Mind. Now fasting the mind is, is basically starving the mind of stimulation, starving the mind of external stimuli and allowing the mind to become completely still. Now why this ancient lifestyle philosophy is very important to understand in our modern day is because we have become far too busy in our modern world. We are all far too busy. We are constantly in motion. And whenever we experience any sign of boredom or doing nothing, we will do anything to fill that up. So we don't embrace boredom and we don't embrace doing nothing as a result. Fasting the mind, on the other hand, teaches you to embrace boredom, to embrace doing nothing. Boredom, for example, is only a response, a feeling we have because we've become too accustomed to doing too many things. When you have started to do nothing more often and boredom comes, you actually embrace it. You become more conscious of your breath. You become more conscious of the sounds in nature or the sounds of where you are in the environment. You might hear the birds that no one can hear. You might hear the cicadas that no one is conscious of. And you'll become more attuned to reality, the real world. Now, this method of fasting the mind, of bringing your mind back into nothingness and just to be consciously aware of your breathing and, and this and that, has a big effect on your nervous system. And this whole lifestyle philosophy and practice actually has a massive effect on your nervous system. To explain that, we need to understand that there are two branches of the autonomic nervous system. There is the sympathetic nervous system, which is related to doing activity and is what is activated in, with the fight or flight response. And then there is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is related to non-doing, passivity, and rest and digest. Now to use Chinese thought 
in relation to these, the sympathetic nervous system is, is related to young, related to the masculine, the active, and the heat element. And the parasympathetic nervous system is related to yin, the feminine, the passive, and the cooling element. So basically when, when we're doing nothing, we are cooling down our psychosomatic organism. When we're active, we are heating up our psychosomatic organism. So the sympathetic nervous system basically is activated in cases of emergencies to mobilize energy. It's also activated when we are in motion and when we are consuming stimuli through our senses. So when we are constantly consuming things, as we have become accustomed to, we are constantly consuming information through the smartphone, the internet, watching TV, listening to gossip, so forth and so on, you are only ac activating your sympathetic nervous system. So the problem has become is how do we access the parasympathetic nervous system? Now this is one of the focuses within the philosophy and practice of fasting the mind and also one of the aspects of mindfulness in general. Because the parasympathetic nervous system is activated when we relax deeply. Now I don't mean sitting in front of the TV and, and tronning out. I mean relaxing deeply in, med in meditative absorption. So, Cultivating a meditation practice, for example, if you do 20, 20 to 30 minutes in the morning, this accesses your parasympathetic nervous system, which nourishes your entire day of activity. Just that simple, that one simple activity. Obviously backed up with mindfulness through the, through the day will contrib contribute to more authentic actions coming from yourself. So the problem with a very active world is we are only accessing the sympathetic nervous system, only one branch of our autonomic nervous system. Now, the sympathetic nervous system, as a result, has become overstimulated. And when you have an overstimulated sympathetic nervous system, you begin to overload your samskaras, your subliminal impressions, your, your mental impressions. And when you overload your samskaras, this begins to contribute to radio NST being very loud um, and the noise often drives you in inauthentic ways. So our samskaras, they will drive our vasanas, our habit patterns, and our karma, our action, which affects the noise of radio NST. So this all comes from the poor quality of the four nutrients we're consuming and the lack of awareness we, are, we have with our own life the lack of mindfulness we are showing towards our own life. So we need to find practices and methods to counter this. Okay, so one of the fasting the mind tools is Anapanasati. This is very popular in Vipassana meditation. But Anapanasati is a fasting the mind tool that we can use to be more conscious in our everyday life. Now, Anapanasati is a Pali word and it means awareness of respiration or awareness of breathing. Now, why is this important when we talk about radio NST and samskaras? Well, it is important because this Vipassana meditative technique, actually, when you constantly do it more often, you get further and further and further down into your own sensorium, down to your sensory level, your samskara level, where the, where the subliminal impressions are that drive your vasanas, your habit patterns, and your karma, your actions. What this means is the constant awareness of the sensory level is where we transform our samskaras. When we constantly become more conscious of that deep sensory level that, dri that drives our habits and our actions, we'll transform them. Transform them. We, be we begin to be more intimate with these senses and when, as a result from being more intimate, we begin to understand them and then transform them. This is what is, what is important with Anapanasati. Now, another more simple practice is to get back to the fundamentals of life. Now, the fundamentals is part of the fasting the mind philosophy and practice, the lifestyle philosophy and practice. Now, the fundamentals are simple, healthy diet, daily exercise, daily meditation, and prioritizing your sleep. So with diet, very simple. Take in real organic whole foods, no processed foods, 
which will contribute to health and well-being in moderation of course exercise daily exercise you don't have to be superman but you know work up a sweat get your heart rate up they, if you do this daily this will contribute to more health and well-being and keep you more centered meditation as i just mentioned was anapanasati is one meditative technique i recommend there is just open awareness meditation that they practice in Zen, which is another good one. Sitting meditation, which will access the parasympathetic nervous system in the morning. Now, a lot of people say 20 minutes each morning, but I would recommend 30 minutes in the morning and maybe 20 minutes just before bed. Now, the fourth one, a lot of people overlook, prioritizing sleep. Now, what this means is you actually treat sleep as a very important part of your life. A lot of people don't think about sleep as something that's very important, but we need to remember that a, a large majority of our life is spent in sleep, so we should work to sleep well every day. So the way to prioritize sleep is to develop methods to make you sleep more deeply. One method is from Optimal Life Coach Brian Johnson, and he had this method of digital sunsets, and I think this is a great method. This is basically where at 6 p.m. you turn off all digital screens, and you, you, know, you either read or you get engaged in a conversation with your family or your friends at night. And then what this does is this has a, a massive effect on your pineal gland, because your pineal gland, when it's exposed to blue light constantly, it doesn't produce melatonin, which actually makes you go to sleep. But when you turn off the digital screens early, your pineal gland is starting to get into the circadian rhythm of life and, and is starting to recognize, oh, it's nighttime, and it's releasing melatonin, and you start to get a bit dozy even before bedtime. So this contributes to very deep sleep. It's a great practice that I practice, and it's beautiful. Another one is by Tim Ferriss, social entrepreneur, investor, um, human guinea pig, and his method, he actually got this from a doctor and the doctor didn't actually know why this particular drink actually knocks you out cold at night, but it does and, and I've used it a lot and it definitely does, Tim uses it. And all this is is hot water with two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, one tablespoon of honey, and boom, lights out, you are gone if you have that half an hour before bedtime. My wife and I, she usually puts some chamomile in there for extra effect, extra knockout effect, and it definitely works. And it doesn't matter what time you go to bed. I'm, these days, because I'm trying to prioritize sleep, I'm going to bed at 9 p.m., and my wife thinks I'm some sort of granddad because it's too early, but when you go to bed early and you rise early, you feel much more energized through the day, much more alert and awake, and you're more excited about life. A lot of people don't like to meditate early in the morning because they think it's a chore, but when you have a good night's rest, you are excited about it. So we need to activate the parasympathetic nervous system more often every day. That's the priority of a lot of, of the fundamentals I just mentioned, the priority of Anapanasati, the priority of mindful awareness that Thich Nhat Hanh explained. So we can do this by completely shutting down sensory input. This is the aspect of fasting one, shutting down sensory input. When we shut all sensory input down, we are beginning to access the parasympathetic nervous system. Though radio NST might still be tuned in, when you sit there for longer periods of time, it will slowly, the, the noise will slowly dissipate. This is the withdrawal of the senses and mind activity, pr prachahara in Sanskrit. So basically, the practice of prachahara is where our attitude and our actions become pure from practicing that as a result. The more you shut down the bombardment of the sympathetic nervous system, when you stop being so active and you stop taking in a lot of external stimuli, you, your actions become more pure as a result. So we need to realize that the parasympathetic nervous system nourishes the sympathetic nervous system. And this corresponds actually to Chinese thought because in Chinese thought, it is believed that yin nourishes yang. 
but you don't have to think in terms of allocation of time. You just need to, to think in terms of allocation of energy. Okay. So for example, half an hour meditation in the morning will energize you for the rest of the day. Just the same as exercise can nourish you for the rest of the day, meditation will do that. So if you access the parasympathetic nervous system, it will nourish you for the rest of the day. It'll keep you centered if you back it up also with mindfulness through the day, being conscious of what's happening around you and your breath. So as a result, of, because the parasympathetic nervous system nourishes the sympathetic nervous system, is your actions become more pure, more authentic, and spontaneously virtuous. Alan Watts once said that when you meditation actually enhances and nourishes your intellectual life. And, and this corresponds to the nervous system. This corresponds to the parasympathetic nervous system nourishing the sympathetic nervous system. You begin to act more spontaneously, more authentically, and you become a virtuous person as a result. So in conclusion, if we apply this method of fasting the mind and mindful awareness as our protection against toxins that we take in through the four nutrients and the, and the distracted mind that results of those toxins, we will be able to remain healthy and safe because we will be taking in only those nutrients that help us thrive. So if you want to know more about the four nutriments of Buddhism, I highly recommend you to read Thich Nhat Hanh's book, Silence, and also get engaged in other philosophies of Buddhism that contribute to this four nutriments of Buddhism. So I hope you enjoyed this episode today, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Hey everybody, thank you for watching this episode of Enlightenment today. If you enjoyed this episode, and want to see more, please subscribe to my YouTube channel right here. Also, to watch some of my previous episodes of Enlightenment Today, click down here, okay? So thank you for watching, and let's continue to learn, grow, and love more together.